Um, so uh, welcome, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, we are at step five in our ethical framework. Uh, like we always say, which is all about ethical readiness for AI. So until now, we held for each step of our framework, one webinar aiming at schools, universities and teachers and another webinar aiming more at educational businesses. Um, but um, for step five, which is all about AI techniques themselves and the challenges and opportunities around modeling, uh, we felt it make more sense to hold two webinars. Uh, so today and the, the, part, the next part would be on Thursday, both aiming at both educational businesses and educators. So today and on Thursday, I'll, I'll take you through what step five is all about. Um, uh, which is um, AI techniques, what, what, what kind of techniques are there and uh, which one could be adequate for education? How do we think about the, the challenge of choosing and how do we think about the challenge of evaluating them? Uh, and how do we make sure that we are doing it right? So uh, today in part one, we will discuss artificial intelligence in education and the way we approach questions regarding how and where AI should be used. We will also be, uh, we will also very briefly uh, explain key concept about artificial intelligence so that we will all understand what it means to do AI, uh, what is machine learning and what it is composed of. Uh, in part two on Thursday, we will discuss some of the misconceptions around AI and what is a well-designed AI, what questions we should ask AI developers in order to evaluate how good is the AI solution they are suggesting will deploy. So today we will focus on the questions of what type of AI uh, techniques are there and which would be appropriate for me. And on Thursday, we will continue from this point on and try to discuss the questions of what do I need to be careful about and how should I be careful? And uh, as in all of our webinars, we will prompt you to look at yourself, your university, school, class, or business through a data and AI lens so that you can develop an AI mindset and generally make better decisions about where and how to leverage AI. And again, as in every webinar, and maybe even more so today, we will remind you how different and complementary are human and artificial intelligences and how we use this understanding to evaluate and choose AI solutions. Because it's, it's always imperative that we take our AI journey armed with the understanding that a key for successful AI journey lies in the relationship between human and artificial intelligences and understanding exactly each side what it does best and how they can best work together to make sure we support well our educational system. And today, hopefully, is, is Carmen, is Carmen joining join us, Roland? Uh, we're, uh, she's just, uh, we're just waiting for her to come into the room. So. Ah, great, fantastic. So um, I'm so happy to have to have here today with us uh, Carmen Miles. She is the Director of Innovation, Learning and Teaching in one of the only fully online universities in the UK, Arden University. Um, and Carmen will discuss with us her perspective on state five, step five. And who we are um, from right to left, uh, Ben de Bule, Anissa Moini, Rose Lakin, Mutlu Kukurova, Ali Chaudhry, myself, Carmel Kent, and Ibrahim Bashir, um, all have background in AI and education, um, HCI, human computer interaction, learning sciences, and data sciences. So our seven steps framework for those joining us today for the first time is called ethical, which is the cross cutting theme here. Uh, making sure that all these steps would be implemented ethically. Um, so even if you don't intend to build, to build your own 
uh, AI solution in your school or in your business, using AI mindset or getting ready to use your data in your school or business is always a good strategy. Uh, when done right, of course, as we will discuss mainly on our second part on, on Thursday. Um, and until now, we discussed the four initial uh, steps in previous web webinars, which are first, educate, enthuse, excite about building an AI mindset within your community. Uh, second, tailor and hone the particular challenges you choose to focus on. Third, identify and collate data. Fourth, collect new data relevant to your chosen focus. And fifth today, AI techniques to be applied on the relevant data that you have brought together. So how is AI used in education? So this post appeared a few months ago on Reddit an online discussion platform by a high school kid uh, who was given the task of reorganizing his school parking lot in order to make the traffic flow more efficient. He was considering all kinds of computational techniques and all kinds of open technological platforms to help him achieve that uh, and was discussing his options with other people on Reddit. Now, I do not know what about you, but my high school, school school experience was completely different. Um, to start with, I was not exposed so often to real world problems. My set of tools to handle those was much more limited than this child have. And certainly I wasn't able to discuss it with any professional community member. So technology and AI specifically have changed their role very dramatically in the last few years. And it has and is gaining still a very much bearing effect on students and teachers life. We might say that AI has become a creating entity. So we have here movies composed by AI, or for example, we have on the left MuseNet, which is a deep neural network that can generate four min minute musical compositions with 10 different instruments and can combine styles from country to Mozart to, to Beatles. Unlike artificial intelligence traditional role as a good observer, classifier or predictor, artificial intelligence seems to become creative as well or perhaps better to call it generative because it's not really creative. Then when generative changes reality, a zebra can become a horse, as you can see in, in the upper side of the slide, this, the, the article, and a summer becomes a winter, or for those of you who remember when Nancy Pelosi, the US, the US House Speaker, suddenly becomes drunk. Or as you can see in the slide uh, on the bottom, uh, part of, of um, the article, sorry, on, on the bottom side of the slide, it's a Berkeley study turning researchers into professional dancers. Um, when you'll have the time, just click on, on the, this YouTube. It's, it's just magnificent to see that. Um, and, but this all require, requires us to uh, look very differently about AI and its role. Another few examples, educational examples, a uh, set of ed texts, anything from um, making personalized recommendation to, conver to conversing um, with, with students. You can see here example, for example, from Cogni um, on the left, a virtual learning assistant engaging with the student in a chatbot, chatbot style learning conversation by prompting students to construct an answer and giving them instant formative assessment. You can see Squirrel AI, for example, which is an adaptive uh, education provider in China, and uh, Megpie, which recomm recommends high quality content and integrate integration um, with um, uh, learning systems, and Century Tech, allowing personalized AI-based sequ sequences of learning. So this emergent process is taking place currently currently mostly outside of schools, whether we want it or not. Um, and it is accompanied by a much more 
regulated and so slow process of embracing AI and te technology in general within schools. Technology um, has also gone from becoming mediating to assistive. So here are two examples, both of them from Microsoft. So seeing AI is, is a, it's a talking camera app for those with a visual impairment. It's, it speaks text as soon as it appears in front of the camera, describes colors, recognizes friends, describes people around you, including their emotion, etc. Or um, Microsoft um, tool for converting photos to Excel spreadsheets, uh, along with uh, numbers, um, list recipes, etc., etc. Hmm. So, yeah, AI, AI has gone from observing and classifying to generating, from recommending to conversing, from mediating to assisting. Surely outside of school, it is already changing our behavior and um, even more so for those who are more vulnerable like children, as you can see reported here in the article in the lower side of the slide. If you haven't heard a five years old barking rude commands at uh, digital assistants like uh, Alexa or Siri, you may still be naive about that. On the other hand, we can see very good example, for example, the, the paper here on the right, um, which shows that bots actually improve the collective performance and communications of, be, between human groups. So um, yeah, uh, Roland asked me to uh, put a, a ca caution here for a very uh, offensive content here. So sorry in advance. Um, and the question is whether we can trust artificial intelligence, because as you can see, and we all know, we, we have many such examples of irresponsible artificial intelligence solutions when machines are allowed to learn from humans without any regulation. So I, I guess you all heard about the horrifying case of Microsoft Tay going from friendly to a Nazi bot in just 24 hours. Obviously, the use of AI in education should be safeguarded. A student, particular, particularly when there are children, are very vulnerable. And in general, we are all here because we care deeply about education. And we all feel, you know, that education done right is central to anything that we are um, approaching or, or facing or want to be facing. So to make sure that we're choosing, designing, and looking at AI with the right set of tools, we must base our decisions on the understanding of what is our, humans, unfair advantage, which are the skills that we have that is unique to us and we are uh, good at, and what is AI's unfair advantage. It is only with this understanding that we, would, that we could know where we want to guide our students to and know what we require or expect from AI solutions. So yes, things are massively changing. We feel we need a new framework to think about things and we suggest to look through the prism of a human AI collaborative intelligence. There is a new social contract that needs to be made between us and our students and between us and machines. For that, we need to make sure that both us and our students understand better where machines excel, where we humans excel, and thus how we can harness AI to make us progress, not replaced, not reduced, not disempowered. We need this kind of infrastructure to look at things, an infrastructure that we can trust and that will support us in achieving our educational goals effectively, whether it is to prepare students to tomorrow's workforce, to better cope with COVID, um, or just to make learning and teaching better designed for our needs. So we, what do we have? We have doubt, we have conscious, we have critical views. We have the ability to transfer skills. So after dealing with a task in one specific space, 
we have the ability to have an idea on, on how to deal with the same task in another space. We have the ability to learn how to learn. We have meta-learning, as Professor Rose Lacking is talking about in this book, Machine Learning and Human Intelligence. And on the left, you can see Lee Seidel beaten by AlphaGo in um, 2016. But what you really see is us losing in an unfair game. This is a human playing where technology had the unfair advantage. So we are talking about Go playing, but the same as image classification, speech recognition, handwriting transcription, digital assist assistants like uh, Alexa, autonomous driving. These are all challenges tailored to the unfair advantage of technology over us. Some key unfair advantages of technology are here on the left. Very generally, of course, because different technologies usually use different unfair advantages over us. And if they don't, they are usually not good for us. So we're talking about pattern matching, replicating, repeating. This is why it works so well with uh, more simple, repetitive, administrative tasks like question and answer bots, etc. And in the bottom right of the slide, you can spot the classification of humans' cognitive biases and heuristics, and there are plenty of them, which explains why we are not that good in making rational decisions. So it is important to understand that AI is not inherently subject to those biases, but AI is very good at replicating those biases. And even more importantly, it's important to understand that human cognitive abilities are not infinite. Instead, we have limited computational skills and very flawed memories. And this is exactly where AI excel with potentially almost infinite storage and computational power over us. So let's take an example detection, detection skill versus identification skill. People, people are great identifiers. We are using schemas of previously known knowledge and put the semantics into the detected shapes. How many kitten image can you see and how many ice cream image? For an algorithm, each image is just a set of image features, patterns of pixels. But we can see beyond the pixels. Machines are best at detection, as you see on the left side, but are very bad at putting the semantics into identifying. And one very important manifestation of this conflict between AI and humans' unfair advantage is the way in which AI can support teachers by helping to streamline assessment tasks. AI can show us where we learn best, which task we find difficult. And discovering those bottlenecks in learning means teachers can then try to remove them to optimize the quality of their work and students' learning. So for example, by providing real time tailored um, to the student feedback, as you can see a good example here on the, on the right side. Um, so this is a study where the experimental group getting analytics-based st streamlined feedback showed significantly different patterns in their learning and performed betters, better in terms of final grades. So think of such a technology as a very keen, very thorough observer using whatever, sensors, cameras, whatever, that can learn from teachers the type of needed feedback. So what is the catch here? The catch is again around unfair advantage. As long as exams are more of memory tests or recall tests, which promote the idea that um, every problem has a right answer or a single right answer, such, such as when we assess uh, vocabulary, factual knowledge, plagiarism, then exams really test machines intelligence. And of course, as the title suggests, they will do an excellent work in marking, but, they will obviously be very challenged in assessing creative problem solving, collaboration, empathy, and other skills. So 
what is this AI thing and where does this unfair advantage of it comes from? In very simple terms, artificial intelligence refers to algorithm mimicking or replicating human traits of thoughts and reasoning. While general purpose AI is still the ultimate goal, we are several decades away, away from it, if ever. We are, however, getting very good at narrowly focused artificial intelligence, which is focused on a very specific, well-defined task and usually in a very well-defined subject domain. Today, most artificial intelligence pro pro products sorry, are technically based on machine learning. Still, not all AI is machine learning and um, not all data-driven technologies are AI. Most AI solutions during most of the years up, up until one or two decades ago were what we call today good old artificial intelligence, which is based on well-formulated knowledge formatted by rules that machines can uh, consume like if then L, if then else rules um, or taxonomies or ontologies, uh, for example, like taxonomies of, of plants. Still until today, uh, fortunately, semantic technologies, um, which are not typically be based on machine learning, such as those seen here in the open link data cloud on, on the left, are brilliant for challenges such as data integration, visualization, uh, recommender system, tutoring systems, question answering, um, some of the chatbot system that we know, semantic search, and many more. What is the main simple difference um, between AI that is not machine learning, uh, as we've seen in the previous slide, and machine learning? So what we call good old AI or typical semantic technology will very simplistically apply a set of usually human crafted rules on a given input data set that doesn't need to be large or representative in essence to output a very well informed uh, outcome or decision or recommendation or, or whatever. The core idea behind machine learning is that you get a set of data and this time it is extremely important of how representative and large this data set is. And sometimes, but not necessarily, as we will see in a, in a minute, some kind of human guidance with regards to how the decisions uh, or recommendations should look like. And then machine learning is the algorithm that learns the rules. So the output in this, uh, in machine learning are the rules or just some uh, patterns of statistical relationships between the different data items in the, in the output, in the input, sorry. So machine learning, uh, we have a bunch of commonly used machine learning techniques, um, which are the basis for almost everything that we use, which will often be selected after evaluating the data that we have and what kind of application or need we are looking at. Very roughly, we can talk about three high level approaches or categories of machine learning algorithm or techniques, supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning and reinforcement learning. I love that um, illustration of Nadia Piat. She's a designer uh, who does very nice illustrations um, about AI of, of those three categories. So I have borrowed them uh, to use it here. So very generally, the term supervised learning is used to describe machine learning algorithms that are trained on a data set that includes the outcome values, usually annotated by a human expert. An example of supervised machine learning is that of a system trained on a set of historical student records, uh, for example, that have been annotated by teachers or other experts to identify whether or not these students came across some difficulty in a specific assignment or dropped out early uh, on their studies or just managed to find a job within six months of university graduation, whatever it is we are looking to predict or understand better. 
the supervised machine learning algorithm will try to learn and predict whether a new student, which we do not know yet very well, will drop off or find a job very easily, or whatever outcome our algorithm tries to predict. So some examples for uh, supervised machine learning, we have classification algorithm that are used to predict a certain class uh, a new observation can be classified with. So classification can be used for spam filtering, language detection, sentiment analysis, uh, whatever, with, with techniques such as naive based decision trees, logistic regressions, support vector machines. Um, another type of, of supervised learning, sorry, is regression techniques, where instead of uh, predicting a certain class, we will try to predict a specific value. Like for example, let's try to predict a grade. Example for such techniques are linear regression, random forest regressor, etc. Unsupervised learning is when we do not know or don't want to know or just we don't have any access to the values of the outcome. So there is no human guidance or supervision inherent to the algorithm. We would still, however, like to identify some patterns hidden in the data. For example, we want to find groups of similarly able students in order to tutor them, tutor them separately or to use different interventions with each group. Commonly unsupervised techniques are, for example, clustering, dimension reduction. A third less common type of machine learning is reinforcement learning. Similarly, to some extent to supervised learning, it uses feedback uh, to find and learn what is the correct behavior. But unlike supervised learning, reinforcement techniques do, do not use a given outcome as feedback. Instead, they use a set of rewards and punishment as signals for positive and negative pat patterns of behavior. So the reinforcement algorithm will try to minimize the punishments or maximize the rewards. And there, therefore, it will um, craft their pattern. So reinforcement learning can be used, for example, for self-driving cars, robot vacuums, um, and games. And there are many methods that can be built on top of these basic common algorithm that can use to improve them like ensemble, stacking, boosting, um, which I will not have time to go through. Um, yeah, so you can read more on a website where we have a few of bite-sized uh, resources about AI in education, but again, Nadia Piet here, um, she put up a, this very super nice and simplistic flowchart that I thought can give you some high level idea on how to choose whether or not to use machine learning and which type. So of course, real life is, is much more complicated as we will talk on Thursday webinar, but this is a good basic flow of logic indicating the importance of data and also the distinction between supervised algorithm where you have human expert annotation and unsupervised, unsupervised when, you, when we do not. One last thing probably um, good to mention is um, chatbots, which are based on natural language processing technologies. Um, here again on the right, you can see that as much as the chatbot or conversational agent or conversational algorithm as we call them, tries to be more wide, more general, general purpose like Siri or Alexa, for example, they will reach less good results in terms of how accurate they are and how rich they are in their ability to respond logically. So it should be, it should be obvious to us that if a machine learning algorithm is trained on um, thousands of conversations, uh, data set of math tutoring, for year nine students for a specific trust in, in the UK, for example, it will have much more chance of understanding how to feedback them than another machine learning algorithm trained on millions and billions of general purpose conversations of let's say a global um, call center, for example. 
and, and in the left side, you can see one example from Google on how to evaluate the logical response level um, that chatbox, chatbots have in a measure um, called sensitivity and specificity, uh, SSA. So, um, is Carmen with us, Roland? Uh, yes, yes, she is, absolutely. Great, brilliant. So, Carmen is the Director of Innovation, Learning and Teaching at Arden University, um, which is one of the only universities in the UK which was not very, which was, sorry, very well prepared uh, for the trans transformation to online learning. Um, because they're actually doing it, I think, for 20 years, right, Carmen? Remote learning, how, how much well, time can... are you doing it? Um, yes, hello, Carmen, hello, everyone. Um, yes, they've been doing online learning for over 25 years. And I think I'm not too late now because I now talk about distance learning for, say, 30 years. I'm not sure. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, um, well, which has been, um, I think, probably not, even though we were well placed, it has been such an accelerated time that um, I think it's allowed us to really focus on things like everybody and really just get ahead in online learning in a way we probably haven't realised. You know, some of our plans for 2020 are really forward. I just got a question about the um, muffling. Is that my sound? I just want to check that. I, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's coming through a little bit crackly. Uh, can you hear that, uh, Carmel? Okay. Can you... Yeah, I, I, I ah. hear you breaking very much, yeah. Uh, oh. I want to speak a little bit further away from the camera, uh, from, the, from the microphone. <laughs> yeah, okay, is that better? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think okay, so, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so, I mean, aside from serving as a, a senior leader in the university, I um, just want to tell everyone that Carmen is also a researcher uh, focused on online learning. And I, I had a, the joy of working with Carmen in the past. And I know that we have so much uh, to learn from her. Um, so thank you so much for coming, Carmen. And, and please, um, can you tell us a bit yourself, your role in, in Arden University? Yes, um, yeah, of course. And when, so part of my research is about um, student engagement in online learning. So I was really interested in um, when I met Carmel and her work. And um, I'm coming at it really from a pedagogy side. So um, less of the um, data analytics and the side that Carmel looks at in machine learning, but looking at how we can teach better online. So in terms of machine learning, it offers um, a lot of opportunities, I think, for our teachers, and I'm keen to call them teachers, so our professionals who are teaching us, is that they're more informed. Uh, because when I first started online learning, we were keeping lots of spreadsheets and constantly trying to get snapshots of data. And that was really difficult because, um, of course, the situation changed every day and that wasn't possible to keep doing that. So very early interventions that we did um, were really from a student support side. And I think that's probably a natural progression by universities when they look at, so what does this tell us about our students as they come into the university? Are they engaging, um, setting milestones? But of course, that's only really very useful if the engagement metrics that you've decided are actually valuable. Um, and that's quite difficult because something that I think we're learning now as a sector and certainly at our university is that um, we have to be so much more adaptable. So our student needs um, are very different. So if they choose not to engage with us in a certain way, oh, sorry, I'm not a bad person. <laughs> if they choose to interact with us in a certain way, then um, there's little meaning we can draw from that. 
So um, what we're now looking at is um, looking at how they interact. And that was something that Carmel um, really sort of introduced me to really when um, you were working with us. And looking at uh, the types of activities that they engage with online. But it's really, um, I think a lot of what we used to do was very much about what we could learn from about our students and, and put in interventions on. Whereas the tide has definitely turned about what the students can learn about themselves and what's valuable to the learners. Because it was certainly a lot of interventions that we, um, so we universities do. I think it's very often to inform decision makers, which is very useful and where to put resource. But it never really seems to be about the learning experience. And I obviously only know that because I'm really trying to push that. So um, something that um, I've been really working on is getting a learning platform where we have valuable metrics. Um, so that we can get something out of the student and also so we have more things that are less intensive so that the lecturer time can be more valuable. So um, automated feedback, for example, feedback in online learning is, is very difficult and engagement is really difficult. But if we can have ways to track that in different settings, like one thing that we're really working on at the moment is webinars because we know that a webinar can be a very passive experience. So we've set up lots of activities so that we can track engagement in, in webinars. So I'm going to stop talking there. And I don't know if you've got, if you've got anything um, that you wanted to raise, come on, on any of yeah, that. No, so first, don't stop talking. It's, it's really brilliant. <laughs> and I, I love the, the, um, the concept of how the, the, the variables is so important to, uh, to think about way before you're just coming to apply some uh, nice sophisticated technique and also the idea that um it's 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 kind of your eyes and ears where mm. where you don't really see the students and where most of the the learning is asynchronous and i think it really would be interesting for me and i'm sure for all, all, everyone to hear uh, from you as, as someone who is so um well positioned in in the world of online learning um which online learning is very unique uh with respect to data and ai because a there, there is more significant need uh, as you said uh, you don't you don't see the students you don't know where their mm -hmm. mind is wandering right now uh, you need more sensors you need more eyes and ears and, and second because um by definition they will usually use more technology uh, routinely. Um, so at least in potential, there are digital footprints all around the, the learning management, the Moodle, uh, LMS, everything they're doing, even the webinars. Um, so uh, can, you, can you please tell us a bit more about what's your, what's your vision um, in terms of Arden? And, and maybe specifically, I mean, I know that a lot of universities have brilliant teachers working and have some brilliant ideas that they want to push in their class or in their course, but it's very, very different from something coming top down from a university perspective, you know, uh, a university talking about we want to, for example, uh, implement a warehouse to systematically collect the data and, and analyze that and um, suggest something to those teachers. So w w what is your vision in terms of enabling the teachers to have their own uh, initiatives or the university mm. suggesting something to them? Yeah, I mean, we've currently got, I think what's really helped is because we've, we've just done um, a, a huge rollout of training using Adobe Connect platform. Mm. And on the back of that, um, there's a lot more features. So it's not technology driven. However, it's almost like having a showcase. And I think that's really important of having a demo by experts because I think a lot of the time my lecturers don't know what's available to them or it feels a bit there's too much of a gap because we have what's available but then we have what we're able to do mm. so I think part of that has been about narrowing the tools down that people use and just letting them become more familiar with those 
and then what we've been running um, out of that um, is um, we've been doing some uh, like a, an appreciative inquiry process where we get every all different groups of people together, our focus groups, uh, to feed in their ideas. And we've got I think I've got about two hundred different ideas of thing of different things that people are doing. So I've categorised those into different themes. Wow. And one of the themes is, which is really, and I'm just about, funny enough, before I took this call, I'm just about to put them onto a really nice um, illustrated mind map so uh -huh. it can capture everything that people have done. And of course, that hasn't come from me. I couldn't have thought about it. I couldn't have just come up, up with all of that myself, obviously. So, so we're sharing this mind map, and then we're just about to roll a staff development plan out, starting from September. Um, so that will just be about teaching online, but we just also developed a PG cert in digital pedagogy that is going to be rolled out to everybody. So that's a that's more waiting, nice. obviously, but. Yeah, but it's also we're just setting up this centre. So previously my role was director of learning and teaching and it was very strategy. But this is really about the groups of people and sharing kind of practice that we've really just not had time to, you know, to be frank. But I think it's sometimes about just seeing what your colleagues do. And we all know this, but I think because we focused on on just some tools. Um, and then, of course, we're doing lots of, we're doing so many more meetings using Teams mm. and we're embedding, um, the, so in terms of licensing, um, we're giving students access to way more. So, we're, you know, we're giving them increased license privileges so that when we ho hold meetings, we're able to use a lot of the features within Teams that we haven't used before. So, um, so there's a number of kind of things going on, but in terms of in terms of the like overall vision, it's really just about. It's quite simple. There's probably a few strands to it. One is about the um, student digital capabilities and ensuring that students are actually able to access the systems because it doesn't matter what you're doing in there if people aren't accessing. So having metrics and and really strong induction around that and mm. um, I'm going to move him. Sorry. Um, then we also have um, digital capability program for our, for our lecturers, you know, with different levels. But something really interesting that came out of it was um, that people found that the online learning was much more accessible and inclusive than what they would found in their face to face in the blended sessions. So obviously there's a lot of talk about um, online learning not being um, suitable or not really engaging everybody, but people saying they found that more, more inclusive because they're able to private message people. It's so much more instant in terms of the access. Right. So there's a lot of affordances that we've gained by using technology that we hadn't got before. And of course, as we design that, then we can obviously uh, build in the bits that, like, say, a human intervention and the bits that are machine learning. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's very exciting because we didn't have, it's almost like we've been trying to push this forward, but obviously it's coming together at quite a pace. You know, and I think there's obviously a demand, isn't there? Yeah, there's yeah, a demand absolutely. For and a new type of learning. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I think I think it's it's brilliant. I mean, you are talking about having some kind of a support top down while limited the the arsenal of of, mm. of tools used and giving them some really good support um, as a as a as a baseline for everyone to start, both mm. the teachers and and the students. But at the same time, having a bottom up um, innovation mm. wind coming from people. Mm. And, and and bringing that that into the the strategy that's that's great um mm. wanted to ask you something a bit maybe it's a bit a bit of a sidetrack so we can come back mm. later um so how how do you what's your opinion of how to gain trust because i think a lot of universities going now to online and students mm. are doing everything online will have some questions about what data is being collected about me what what are you doing with this data are you predicting anything about me um are you are you doing anything that wouldn't be um um wouldn't be in my interest so how how do you 
how do you gain trust with, with so many students such as, as you're dealing with uh, to help them trust the technology, trust the, the data that they are providing by those tools? Yeah, I, I think it's a valid question. And I think a lot of the data that's used is, um, it's almost seen as, um, I don't think they see it as the wider university collecting the data because it's um, the lecturer, if that makes sense. Mm, mm, mm. So the lecturer is definitely owning their classroom, which is actually quite empowering because they haven't really felt that. I think we've shifted definitely in terms of our data from it being a wider kind of thing to it being more local. Mm. So I think there's, I think there's some, I think there is something around that about it not just going off to someone who's making decisions about you, like right. you're saying, and using it in that way. We've also, I think, shifted very much away from. Um, the predictive kind of analytics okay. because we yeah and, and I think that I think that's helped as well because um, there's, there was a bit of a tension I think between like um, a student support kind of um, I don't know that I think there was lots of well there was a bit of a tension and I think yeah. it's natural you know you've got people natural. who are concerned about student numbers you know are these the people that you know have we got the right people in the right programs Whereas our lecturers, you know, they want to make sure that they know who they've got and that, that they're able to work with their groups that they've got. So um, there is, I think there's probably different different understandings around what we'd use the data for. And I think because it's it's really come into the academic space, I think that's really, it's definitely helped us more. Yeah. yeah on yeah. that side. Yeah. It, it's a great, it's a great point about uh, shifting from predictive analytics uh, because it's, it can be challenging to do predictive analytics in a way that um, would preserve anything that we want to preserve. Uh, although there are, there are ways to do it, but I think um, it, it is a very good point in terms of gaining trust. Um, yeah, and, and, then, and then anything that we collect, I mean, at the moment we're just revived, we're revising our cloud campus. Honestly, my voice is so noisy today, I apologize about that. No, 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 we can um, hear you. <laughs> Yeah, so um, yeah, we, we're just redevising a cloud campus. So anything that's kind of visible um, or that we have access to, then that is on their, that's on their dashboard. So I think that increased visibility and it doesn't really quite feel the same as when well, I own all this data and now I'm reaching out to you. It's almost like, well, you've got control over this data because if you press this button and you do these activities, that will affect kind of how your dashboard looks. So it almost looks like it's student. I think this, I'm not an expert in this, but I'm just thinking that if the student feels like they're driving that decision, I'm thinking that's probably part of it as well. That's, that, that's brilliant. Yeah, I have so many questions, but um, I would let maybe other people ask questions. Roland, do we have any question from, from the audience? We don't in the chat. I mean, uh, we do actually just have one in the chat right now, actually, from Rohit. Uh, and right. it is, uh, as a researcher, what are the things which we should consider for, uh, what are the things that we should consider when uh, trying to find the right balance between learner control, uh, teacher control, and system control? So when, when you're designing, uh, how do you sort of keep, keep a balance of all those different things from those perspectives? That's, that's a brilliant question and, and links so well to what Carmen was talking about. I think uh, the, the, f I would say from my perspective, and I would be very uh, happy to hear Carmen from your perspective. I mean, exactly as Carmen said, when we use the data, I mean, so use the data and the models in a very transparent way. So the teacher or the learner should um, see the data for their own use, so for their own understanding about themselves, about their learning process. Once they have the, the data in front of them, whether it's um, modeled, uh, whether it's just pure visualiz visualization, as, as we have done uh, many times before with, with, with companies that we are working with, uh, it gives them so much empowerment and, and um, mm -hmm. the, the the, the feeling that they are really, um, they have the autonomy, they can control and that, that, that in that sense, the data is really an enabler for that. What, what do you think, Carmen? 
Yeah, I, th I think and that, that, that's a really good point. And I think for me that in the design of it, I, th I think it just depends what context, because everything is very highly contextualized, isn't it, in education? Mm. And what we're finding is that we are talking to students throughout everything at the moment that we do. And I know it's quite difficult because, you know, they've got a different perspective on it. But I think sometimes it's just about having the right people, just running things by the right people and consulting with the right stakeholders. Because certainly that's something that really kind of upsets me, really, when I think, I'm not the expert in this, but I have the decision on this. So, but then something else you are doing, but then I'm not consulted, but somebody else is. So I think sometimes it's just making sure you've got the right voices so that, you know, you can design things with, with the right, you know, the nuance, depending on what it is you're trying to do. Okay. So if you... Yeah, I think it's that because obviously that's quite a wide area, isn't it? So that's quite a lot yeah, of yeah. And and I think what you mentioned, Rohit, about system control, uh, if I understand correctly, what you mean by that. Um, naturally, I think that when when you do when you apply machine learning um, or any kind of modeling actually on the data, you process the data, it kind of to some extent loses its raw shape or its initial shape, it looks different. Mm -hmm. And then it feels like the system takes control of it. So this is exactly where we should use, um, and we will talk about it actually on Thursday quite a lot, we should use some mechanisms to make the model very transparent so that the, the, the learner and the mm -hmm. teacher would be able to see exactly what kind of processing happened to the data what kind of pro processing took place what kind of how how did a system reach um a certain mm -hmm. decision and even if the teacher is the one uh, making the decisions but just informed by the data what kind of data informed their decisions what what did they t take into account um mm. I, c I can give one one example from very very recent um, from from the IB that actually so because because of COVID, the IB um, uh, uh, like the A levels they needed to to uh, apply some data analysis in order to provide grades because the students weren't able to sit exams this years this year um, and so they prov the IB provided just a few days ago the the results but it was so untransparent and it was so so there was no feedback ab about it no way no mechanism to trace exactly how the the the, the grade was given uh, so this is exactly where the learners loses control and this is exactly where the system could have provided him this control mm. Mm. Okay. There is any any more questions, Roland? I see. Yeah. Uh, so Mohammed has asked um, which factors have been shown to make the biggest difference in uh, personalised learning for students, and uh, he's listed a couple. So you'd be suggesting you know, the style of the content, is it the order of the content, is it assessments, is it you know the, the sort of the cross of, uh, of the media types that you that you're using? That's a great mm -hmm. question, Carmen. Do mm. you have any? Uh, perspective yeah. on that from your experience what what is the factors that are more the low the, the, the that gives the best effect in personalizing and <laughs> differentiating yeah I, i'm not sure i have the absolute answer but um there I isn't know there isn't what one yeah so in terms of personalised learning, one of the difficulties we had um, is, is that different departments in the university thought personalised meant something completely different mm. to what the academics meant. So my view of personalised learning was that so that students would be able to have an, an experience that um, was individual to them. OK, so I, so in terms of that, um, my take on that was to have um, a type of learning that was um, that could be navigated by the student and given the student like element of choice of like does it, I think somebody explained it to me once I thought this is this is quite I like this one where it's a structured path but there are opportunities to go you know you can you might want to go off to that direction but so it's a structured path with flexibility 
So I think for me, the, having clear navigation and then feedback on progress and where you are within that path so that the students are able to make choices because if, the, if, they, if they're not empowered to know what that personalised learning looks like, then it's not very personalised, is it? It's, it's very teacher-led. So if you're just doing what I've told you, then I don't think that's personalised. So for me, the personalised was more about the navigation through the through the journey mm. and that would be you know as they can the structure that they go through the content but also then the feedback that they get as they go through the, as they go through the content and I think for me at Arden the bit that we really need to get better at is um, how that ties in with assessments because for me it feels like they've got the journey but then the assessments a little bit separate so mm. um, this course that I've just written I've actually changed the way that I do content. I actually present the activities instead of the content. <laughs> so I'm just going to see and just modeled it quite differently so that the, the learning is more, um, I'm not saying it's more activity based, but the activities that they do are just much more um, weighty. Whereas in our normal content, it's a lot is quite traditional in that we have text, we have MCQs, we have video, we have now comment on this discussion. Whereas I've really narrowed it down to have like this is these are your week activities and they're really quite chunky like they would be if there was in a lesson and they're much more student driven. So I'm creating something, for example, if I'm a if I'm on the programme rather than being led to lots of little bite sized bits. So, yeah, yeah I, I think that, that's that's two very such important points. Um, one of them, your conceptualization of, of learning as a journey. And I, I think. I totally, uh, I totally sympathize with that because, and and the sequence, the order of the activities is very individualized, and um, I think it it it's usually I would risk saying that usually it, it's much more important or have a a very uh, much more impactful um, effect on the learning than the actual content. So mm -hmm. having the autonomy to uh, drive their own learning, um, especially for higher education, I would think so. Um, and and the second point that you were talking about, the link to assessment, that that was very very interesting for me as well. So um, it's actually about the the ability to understand from the assessment, so the ability to to learn and and come back uh, to mm. link back to what I just did to the activities, right? Mm. And, and I think it's probably because we moved from paper to online mm. and I think because Arden's I suppose a little different to some universities that have probably come to online um, but without doing all of that this I mean obviously lots of people you know most people have obviously done distance learning and online learning in some format but because I think we had quite a set way of doing it then we have lots of banks of content we've got lots of content so it's actually quite brave to throw that away really and think actually we're not going to give all this content and all these activities we're just going to stop doing that and do That's something great. else yeah yeah it, it, yeah it is a quite a big decision mm -hmm. because students probably feel that they want that content but for me I can see that in different subject areas of course because we're an online university mainly a lot of our approaches are the same across all subjects Whereas, um, obviously, if I'm writing a course in education, you teach education very differently to what you would business studies or computing, for example. Absolutely. So I think yeah. there's definitely something around that, you know, about how you prepare students in that subject, you know, what we call the subject pedagogy and what that looks like. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, time flight, I mean, that's really a shame. I would be very interested to hear more. Um, Carmen, thank you so much. Uh, it was it was brilliant to have you here. Thanks a lot, Carmen. Um, and I will just wrap it up uh, with what's next. So part two on on Thursday would be more about misconceptions and traps and how to do AI right in despite of of misconceptions and traps and um, we would continue with the series after that. Uh, and we also provide a service to help you through the seven steps to AI readiness. And there is an email address there, help at educateventures.com.
um, at the bottom if you need to find out any more information. So, Roland, to you. Yes, excellent, excellent work, Carmel. Excellent work, Carmen. Uh, thanks everyone for coming along. Um, we uh, we will uh, be in touch with uh, all of you for uh, future webinars and series. Uh, we've got one on Thursday, as Carmel said, and uh, at the Eventbrite link that I that I posted in the group chat, we've also got our future uh, webinars on step six uh, up there as well. So you can sign up for the twenty eighth of. July and the 30th of July for Step 6 with uh, Mugu Kukurova uh, and uh, Professor Benedict de, uh, de Boulay. Uh, so thanks for coming along. And, Thank you. Um, Bye. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.